So over the past two years, we've almost never covered cryptocurrency stories on this show. If I'm honest, it's partly because I've never really understood cryptocurrency stories. And it's partly because I always felt like surely it had to be some sort of scam. So now I feel a bit vindicated because of this guy. Meet Sam Bankman-Fried, the MIT grad and entrepreneur who two years ago founded FTX, an online cryptocurrency exchange for investors, and became a billionaire aged just 29. You've seen FTX, even if you can't pinpoint where exactly. If you watched the World Series earlier this month, you saw the FTX logo emblazoned on all the umpires' uniforms. If you're a Miami Heat fan, you've probably caught a game at the FTX Arena. They bought the naming rights in 2019. And if you watched the Super Bowl, you almost certainly saw this ad. I call it the wheel. Yeah, I don't think so. Can I be honest with you? Yeah, it stinks. And like I was saying, it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. Larry David certainly didn't seem to be curbing his enthusiasm for the multi-billion dollar juggernaut that was FTX, which launched Sam Bankman-Fried into the inner circle of American elites. Here was SBF, as he's known in financial circles, on stage looking the part of an unkept unkempt, excuse me, tech billionaire with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair at a $3,000 ahead crypto festival last April in the Bahamas, where FTX was registered for tax purposes, of course. Katy Perry and Tom Brady also attended. Of course, you may have heard some other news about FTX and SBF in recent weeks. One person told me that FTX has at least an $8 billion hole on its balance sheet. Sam Beckman fried meanwhile, is now on the hunt for his own bailout. FTX has halted international withdrawals due to its liquidity crunch this week. The Securities Commission of the Bahamas late yesterday froze FTX's assets. So you can see there was so many different red flags. A lot of my friends think it's the worst week in crypto, in cryptocurrency history. That's right. FTX, a $32 billion company that was supposed to change the world, it evaporated seemingly overnight in a liquidity crisis, which is economic speak for all of the money is gone. So where did it go in FTX's case? And while we're on that subject, we should remind ourselves, what on earth is cryptocurrency? Bitcoin, Ethereum, what exactly are these? Cryptocurrency is any digital payment system whose value and whose transactions aren't backed by a government or a central bank like the dollar or the pound. Instead, cryptocurrency is backed by an encrypted data record of all its transactions out there in the cloud it's called blockchain. Cryptocurrency doesn't have any intrinsic value, just the value given to it by users on the blockchain and traders and speculators. And if you still don't grasp this, well, neither did a lot of investors in crypto on exchanges like FTX. Sources inside that company have told reporters in recent weeks that Bankman Fried was taking customer funds invested in FTX and diverting them to his own trading company, Alameda Research. But when the news site Coindesk got hold of Alameda's balance sheet earlier this month, they say there weren't a lot of cash assets there either, just more cryptocurrency. Another cryptocurrency called FTT that Bankman Fried and FTX created. That news freaked out investors who moved to pull their assets out of FTX. The only problem, FTX didn't have the money anymore. Insiders telling The Wall Street Journal that many of the problems go back to Bankman Freed and his bad bets with other people's money. He was forced to resign as CEO of FTX, at which point the company declared bankruptcy. Now investigators are zeroing in, are zeroing in on Bankman Freed, whose wealth went from $15 billion to practically zero in the space of three days this month. That must have hurt. Right now, his whereabouts are unknown, but he's still giving interviews and tweeting through it. Quote, I was on the cover of every magazine and FTX was the darling of Silicon Valley. We got overconfident and careless. Cue the sad trombone. Now, you might be thinking, why should I care about a single billionaire's vanity, greed and corruption? We've got plenty of those right now. But this one is different. It's like Enron and Bernie Madoff had a baby and named him Sam. Because in addition to the crisis it's brought to the crypto world, it's also sending shockwaves through the world of philanthropy. There are many charities, causes, and companies that depended on Sam Bankman-Fried's now non-existent wealth, including lots of media outlets like Vox, ProPublica, The Intercept, and Semaphore. And then there were the political donations. 
According to the Center for Responsive Politics, SPF gave $40 million in this past midterm cycle to politicians and PACs, mostly to Democrats. In fact, he was the second biggest donor to Democrats this past election cycle, second only to George Soros. Gentlemen, start your right-wing conspiracy theory engines. Conservatives have already flooded the zone with baseless rumors that SPF was laundering money for Democrats through Ukraine. Some, like fellow tech billionaire and chief twit Elon Musk, have suggested without evidence that SBF was bribing the liberal media and the Democratic Party to look the other way. Never mind that SBF also gave money to Republicans, according to Federal Election Commission records, and that one of his top officers at FTX was the 11th biggest donor to the GOP this year. Right-wing fever swamps are even suggesting that the government is giving FTX a pass because of Bankman Freed's donations to Democrats. Even though federal prosecutors in Manhattan have been investigating FTX since months before it collapsed. And even though Democratic senators led by Elizabeth Warren are demanding accountability in the entire crypto industry. Warren writing in the Wall Street Journal, quote, regulate crypto or it'll take down the economy. And she's right, because we've been here before with mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps, complex, lightly regulated financial instruments that are beyond the grasp of everyday Joes. And I include myself there. Crypto is another such instrument, one for the high-tech age, one that a shaggy 30-year-old Silicon Valley rainmaker can ride to fame and fortune until the sky crashes down on the rest of us. Joining me now to discuss this are Jacob Silverman, contributing editor for The New Republic, and Ben McKenzie, a crypto skeptic and actor best known for his roles on The O.C. and Gotham. Together, they are the authors of the upcoming book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud. Don't worry, Ben, I saw you smiling there. I will be asking a Gotham question in a moment. Jacob, let me start with you. I fear a lot of people are seeing the FTX headlines and just thinking, oh, another dirty billionaire doing dirty billionaire stuff. Why should a regular wage-earning American care about the crypto industry, much less the failure of this one exchange? Well, a lot of people may feel like they have no reason to care. More than 80% of Americans haven't bought into crypto. But if you haven't, you probably know someone who did, maybe someone you care about in your family or a friend, or even a, a company you work for might be exposed to it somehow. And I think what people need to understand is that Sam Bankman fried was supposed to be the person who would kind of make crypto safe for America. Uh, through regulation, kind of leading this political process and kind of rather openly leading the lobbying process. And the failure of Bankman Freed is really the failure of institutional crypto and I think uh, crypto to try to achieve widespread adoption in this country. So, you know, some people may not feel like they're, they're personally affected and they're probably not, but someone who they know probably is. Ben, you're known as an actor, but you have a degree in economics from the University of Virginia. You've been an outspoken critic of cryptocurrencies. Why? And how did crypto become such a phenomenon with this cachet of coolness and fashion even? Well, um, <laughs> cryptocurrencies are not currencies economically. They are rather unregulated and licensed securities. Uh, they are investments of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the efforts of others. Those are the four prongs of what's called the Howey test. That's how we determine securities in this country. And we've had securities laws in the books for 90 years because 100 years ago, we didn't. Uh, we had no federal securities laws, and the rampant fraud in the markets was one of the contributing factors to uh, the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. So we are literally circling back 100 years later to a time before we had securities laws in this country. Uh, they've cloaked uh, cryptocurrency in the uh, you know, the trappings of innovation. Uh, but uh, the truth is the technology is quite old. Uh, blockchain has been around for at least 30 years. So what they've really done is uh, lured an awful lot of regular Americans into an unregulated, unlicensed casino uh, registered overseas, where most yeah. people are going to lose their money. And Ben, you and Jacob met with SBF, I believe, this summer as part of your book project. How did you find him? Did he set off your BS detector? Yes. <laughs> it was going a bit wild. Uh, I spoke with him for an hour and 17 minutes on camera. Um, it was quite an experience. Uh, here was a man who, a young man, 30 years old, who was 
briefly one of the 100 wealthiest people in the world, according to Bloomberg. And yet, when I spoke with him and asked him some fairly simple and straightforward questions, uh, I'm sort of peeking you know, behind the veil here, uh, um, he was unable to answer most of them, uh, almost any of them. Instead, what I got was a lot of deflection, a lot of sort of um, fancy quantitative gibberish talk, and very little substance. Um, the emperor uh, was indeed naked, and I think we're seeing that play out here today. And Jacob, with his billions, SBF was also briefly a leader in this field that's called effective altruism, in which rich people give philanthropically for the good of mankind in a sort of end justifies a means way. Is his downfall the end of effective altruism? Should it be? <laughs> it probably should be. I, I doubt it will be in practice because some very wealthy people still uh, abide by effective altruism and its various offshoots like long-termism. I think what we've seen is that, in practice, effective altruism is basically a, a kind of dorm room philosophical justification for making as much money as you can and, and uh, being greedy and engaging a little self-interest. Uh, and it also says that a rich person knows what's best for society, knows what's best for philanthropic and charitable efforts, and uh, sort of arrogates power to them that would maybe be better decided by a community or, or a political process. So I, I, I think we need... It's certainly a damaging moment for effective altruism, but I think there's enough money behind it that we'll see it limp on. So, Jacob, you're a journalist. You work for the New Republic, a magazine that in the past has been owned by a tech billionaire. What about these media outlets like Vox, ProPublica, Semaphore, that have relied on grants from SPF? Now they're not only in a tougher financial position, they also have the owner of Twitter fueling conspiracy theories that they did SPF's bidding in return for his funding. Yeah, I mean, certainly Elon Musk is not a positive force here because he indulges in any right-wing uh, conspiracy theory that crosses his transom and just is obviously a huge amplifier as a result. I, I think the problem of SBF going down and th these publications that may be in the lurch financially is one that is broader in terms of media business models and funding, which is that, uh, you know, look at any media outlet practically and there's a billionaire underwriting it somewhere and we're all kind of dependent on the largesse of people much wealthier th than us. Yeah. And so I think these are larger problems with media. You'll certainly see some outlets and perhaps some purportedly liberal outlets suffering in the wake of SBF going down. But, you know, unfortunately, many outlets are, are kind of shaking the cup and looking for friendly rich people to donate all yes. the time. So uh, it, while this may be I'm some short term disruption, someone else will come in, I think. And Ben, it's not just media. It's not just the media that was getting money. It was the politicians. A lot has been made of his political donations. SPF is the second largest Democratic donor uh, in these past midterms. There are some Democrats who have become crypto evangelists. Kirsten Cinema co-sponsored a bill to exempt small crypto transactions from taxes. New York City Mayor Eric Adams is still bullish on crypto. He even took his first three paychecks in Bitcoin. They're now estimated to be worth less than half their original value. How do you explain the political love affair with crypto? Is it just a matter of lots of donations from rich folks? Yes, it involves real money. So they made up the <laughs> fake money, but it's the real money that drives the world. Uh, uh, Sam and his cohorts were trying to buy off both sides. Sam was a major donor to Biden and the Democrats, but his cohort, Ryan Salome, donated $23 million to the Republicans. So they're smart. They're not stupid. They were playing both sides. This is not a story of partisanship. Although, of course, partisanship plays a role in everything these days. This is a story of good old fashioned corruption. And when we visited Washington, D.C. this summer, I think the American people will be shocked to know how close we came and perhaps still are to cryptocurrency becoming embedded in our banking system, which would be an absolute unmitigated disaster. Something like the subprime crisis is still possible if crypto uh, gets its tentacles into yes. our banking system. It was very close to doing so this summer. And as Jacob and I toured Capitol Hill, Jacob joked, the ghost of SBF preceded us. He had been in every room, you know, making a lot of donations and a lot of friends. So it'll be interesting to see whether that uh, buys him any leniency on Capitol Hill. But um, but this is not a partisan issue. Jacob. It's not just about SBF, though, is it? As, as Ben points out, this is about the industry. There's uh, what Changpeng Zhao, CZ, as he's known, who's the head of Binance, the big competitor of FTX that helped force FTX under, in a way, in the end. Uh, he kind of hung them out to dry. His still entire net worth is in crypto. He's given half a billion dollars to Elon Musk for his Twitter takeover. Is he someone we should be wary of? 
Oh, certainly. Binance, before this even happened, was by far the largest crypto exchange in the world. Uh, like all of its competitors, it, it does a lot from investing in startups to um, to running exchanges and, and digital assets in countries all around the world. Uh, uh, CZ, as he's generally called, is a major figure in crypto and certainly part of how crypto is uh, conducted and, and spreading globally. Just by watching his Instagram and Twitter accounts, you can see him meeting with presidents and prime ministers around the world every week. He notably does not come to the U.S., probably because he is under investigation by a number of U.S. government agencies, uh, both him and his companies. So I think wow. anyone paying attention to crypto needs to start paying attention to CZ because uh, Binance is pretty soon going to have 50, 60, depending on how you measure it, uh, certainly majority of the global crypto market, if it doesn't already. And it is the major offshore player, especially now that one of their upstart rivals went down. Yes. And one last question I've got to ask before we run out of time. Ben, as a, I'm a Gotham fan, I'm going to ask you, you played Jim Gordon on that show, helping to mentor a young Bruce Wayne. I've got to say, billionaires have taken a real beating in recent weeks. Musk, SBF, Elizabeth Holmes. Is it time for us to reevaluate Bruce Wayne's benevolent billionaire status now? <laughs> It is perhaps time to 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 reevaluate uh, our fetishization of wealth in this country. Um, we are, um, you know, one of the things we're exploring in our book is this golden age of fraud. And I think the parallels between the 1920s and the 2020s are quite um, interesting to study, both the pandemic um, that brought on this excess, but but a, in a larger sense, what are we after here? Um, are we just going to allow people to gamble in what is at best a zero sum game, really a negative sum when you add in the, the sort of the environmental cost and other externalities? Um, are we really just going to encourage this behavior forever or are we going to bring some accountability into the system? And are, can't we aspire to a bit more? Um, isn't there a bit more we could do here to protect each other and to um, dare, dare, dare for a better system, I guess? <laughs> Well said. We will have to leave it there on that note. Ben McKenzie, Jacob Silverman, thank you both. The book is called Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism and the Golden Age of Fraud. It's due out next summer. It can't come soon enough. Still to come. The GOP has found a new word to be obsessed with. Groomers. It's their latest scare tactic to attack the left. But how's their own record when it comes to weeding out or disowning accused and convicted child sex offenders? Time for a hypocrisy check. That's after a short break.